Welcome back to Season 3 of 12 Days in March. In this presentation, we'll resume our discussion of the glomerulopathies, focusing on the key disorders presenting with nephrotic syndrome. As with all recordings, a PDF is available at the website. So we'll pick up our discussion with this reminder of how the patient with nephrotic syndrome presents, including heavy proteinuria and the clinical manifestations that result from protein loss, including edema, thrombosis, hyperlipidemia, and lipiduria. In our previous video, we also contrasted the features of nephritic versus nephrotic syndrome. But again, I need to highlight that the patient with nephrotic syndrome might also have hematuria, hypertension, or renal insufficiency, especially with focal sclerosis or membranous. But the heavy proteinuria remains the defining feature. In the remainder of this video, we will compare and contrast the three primary glomerular disorders, including minimal change disease, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, and membranous nephropathy. We'll focus on the key clinical identifiers, the pathologic features, and then conclude with a few miscellaneous tidbits that you'll need to know for the boards. And just so you shouldn't think I'm a total whack job, the overlap syndromes and systemic disorders, which can also present with nephrotic syndrome, will be presented in a separate recording. So with that introduction out of the way, let's begin exploring the key demographic features starting with minimal change disease. The first thing to note is this is predominantly a disease of children. And although adults may present with minimal change, if they present an adult, you should consider other etiologies on step one. The next key point to anticipate in the question stem is the presence of a triggering event. The common theme to all triggers is that of cytokine release. The common scenarios that elaborate those cytokines include acute infection, atopic disorders such as an insect sting, and the presence of neoplasm with Hodgkin lymphoma at the top of the list. Remember, the Reed-Sternberg cell is alive, well, and producing a variety of chemokines. So those are the relevant demographics for minimal change. Next up is focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. And if I can draw your attention to the small print for just a moment, although I doubt this is a test derivative, do note that focal, that I spell with a K, refers to a portion of the kidney being involved, whereas segmental implies a portion of the glomerulus, thus the focal and segmental portion of the nomenclature. Of course, the sclerosis implies scarring, as we will cover in the pathology section. So what are the important associations with this disorder? These include IV heroin use, HIV infection, and sickle cell disease. There is a primary form of this disorder without a known trigger, but that's not fun for the NBME. And just to let you know, there are other triggers and associations including obesity and anabolic steroid use. So don't think of this as a comprehensive list, but these are the main players. And in questions on focal segmental, the associations will be vital in determining a correct answer. That is, you can expect a question to read something like this. A patient with a history of IV drug use presents with edema. His WBC count is 2.4 with a low CD4 count. 4 plus protein is noted on his urine dipstick. What is the most likely cause for his presentation? Answer, focal segmental based on the implied diagnosis of HIV infection. Without appreciating this association, you could not determine the correct answer. Insofar as urine dipstick and quantifying protein measures, 4 plus protein is not synonymous with 3.5 grams, but as an extreme measure, you will see it used interchangeably. More importantly, any of the other dipstick measures, such as 1 or 2 plus proteinuria, implies mild proteinuria and should not be construed as nephrotic syndrome. This is a common distractor question writers will use in the nephritic disorders. Now moving on to membranous nephropathy. To understand the demographics, you need to have a conceptual understanding of the pathogenesis. Pictured here is a tortoise, right, slow and meandering, just like the pathogenesis of membranous nephropathy. In this disorder, you have antigens and or immune complexes depositing in the subepithelial space. In primary membranous nephropathy, the pathogenesis includes autoantibody against the phospholipase A2 receptor. In secondary forms, there is an associated disorder that is discovered. Examples include hepatitis B surface antigen deposition, tumor-associated antigens, or immune complex deposition in SLE. In all these instances, the deposits are in the subepithelial location and do not provoke a proliferative response. So why is this important in the discussion of the demographic features? Well, because these are the potential identifiers, hepatitis B, SLE, or associated neoplasm. Of note, 
The tumor may or may not be clinically apparent, so in a patient with a new diagnosis of membranous nephropathy, consideration for occult neoplasm should be in the back of your mind, absent another cause. And just to underscore the limited demographic features, this graphic depicts those antibodies deposited in the subepithelial space in primary membranous disease, which accounts for the majority of cases. And before leaving this slide, just a quick comment on SLE. Be aware that there is no singular disorder that characterizes lupus nephritis. Whereas diffuse proliferative is most characteristic, the classification of lupus nephritis includes at least six different subtypes. So the question stem will be clarifying the lupus patient with renal disease. And that will do it for the demographics. So whereas minimal change and focal segmental have fairly classic and important demographic associations, the demographics associated with membranous speak more to the pathogenesis than a specific group of patients at risk. This will all come together after reviewing the pathology. So speaking of pathology, this is big with the primary glomerulopathies. Fortunately, with the nephrotic syndromes, it is fairly logical. So let's start with the light microscopy. Minimal change means just that, minimal change. Nothing is seen. Normal histology, yay, that was easy. Insofar as electron microscopy, this was reviewed in the introductory video. EM demonstrates foot process effacement. It is unlikely that you will need to look at an image and say, wow, that sure looks effaced. Rather, they will query you on the two key derivatives, including loss of charge barrier and the presence of selective proteinuria. Be familiar with this language. Next up is focal segmental. We'll return to that quote from Pathoma that goes something like this. Picture what would happen if minimal change disease progressed in the adult and resulted in scarring. That's what focal segmental glomerulosclerosis means, scarring of the glomerulus. So looking at the light microscopy, what do we see? Scarring. And that scarring is only in a segment of the glomerulus, segmental sclerosis. That's easy. And speaking of sclerosis, I show sclerosis track marks as seen in IV drug abuse to remind you of this predisposing risk factor. Finally, as with minimal change, electron microscopy of the glomerular basement membrane would show foot process effacement. In fact, all proteinuric renal diseases will manifest some element of effacement or damage to the foot processes. Not to harp on the focal and segmental renal involvement, but it is the sclerosis that matters. So whereas minimal change is characterized by normal blood pressure and creatinine, the sclerosis or scarring of focal segmental distinguishes the two. The glomerular sclerosis will be manifest by renal injury that may include an elevation of the creatinine, hypertension, and or hematuria very different from minimal chain. Before proceeding to membranous, please note that immunofluorescence does not play a role in diagnosing minimal change or focal segmental. So if they present a patient with nephrotic syndrome that is not one of the overlap syndromes and the immunofluorescence stains positive for immune complexes, then membranous nephropathy should be on your short list. But I've gotten ahead of myself. The point of this slide was to emphasize the lack of immunofluorescence in minimal change and focal segmental. Got that? It is an important distinguishing feature. So let's move on to the third and final primary glomerular disorder presenting with nephrotic syndrome, membranous nephropathy. Best to start off with the electron microscopy images. They give a visual understanding of the pathogenic process. First, I'll remind you that although we are seeing some deposits and thickening of the glomerular basement membrane, effacement of those little foot processes is also occurring. Next, and here we come back to the pathogenesis discussed earlier, we see deposits of antigen and immune complexes that cause the glomerular basement membrane to thicken. And finally, this is the major take home, because those deposits are present in the subepithelial location and they cause damage to the basement membrane, the podocyte will try to repair the damage. As other inflammatory mediators are not involved, this is a non-proliferative glomerulopathy, thus the preferred nomenclature of membranous nephropathy as opposed to glomerulonephritis. So here's a key slide to test your understanding of the pathology. We have antigens and immune complexes trapped in the basement membrane. The podocyte effort at repair results in production of extracellular matrix and collagen. The result is finger-like projections between the deposits. This repair effort between the deposits are referred to as spikes with a dome-like appearance created by the matrix that essentially surrounds the immune deposits. This accounts for the classic description of the spike and dome appearance. And that brings us back to the light microscopy. The picture on the left shows a special silver stain and is meant to emphasize the spikes as the deposits in the dome do not take up the stain. 
The other key microscopic description is that of diffuse thickening of the glomerular basement membrane, which may also be described by thickened capillary loops. The other thing to note is what you don't see, a proliferative response. Yes, it is immune complex mediated, but lacking other inflammatory mediators, there is no proliferation. And speaking of immune complexes, based on what we've already reviewed, I think you can appreciate the positive immunofluorescence. Remember, immunofluorescence just detects immune complexes. It doesn't care where they are deposited. So let's bring membranous nephropathy home. Here's a graphic highlighting the phospholipase A2 receptor and the immune complex is being deposited in the subepithelial space. The foot processes will be damaged, resulting in loss of charge barrier and damage to the slit diaphragm. In part two of this graphic, we see antigen, such as hepatitis B surface antigen. It too deposits in the subepithelial space, provoking immune complex injury. And finally, we see circulating immune complexes, as one might see in a patient with lupus. Why they deposit in the subepithelial space, as opposed to the subendothelial space, is not known. So that is it for the nephrotic syndromes. Let's summarize. We already reviewed the demographics, but the standout features are a kid with a cytokine-provoking trigger for minimal change. The patient with focal segmental will be described as either heroin-using or HIV-infected. The creatinine may be elevated based on the degree of glomerular scarring or sclerosis. Immunofluorescence won't even be mentioned in minimal change or focal segmental. In a membranous nephropathy vignette, more likely than not, you will see a positive immunofluorescence. So if you have a patient with heavy proteinuria and a positive immunofluorescence, think membranous. Insofar as electron microscopy, they will all be described with foot process effacement and loss of charge barrier. Membranous will also have immune complexes deposited in the subepithelial space. And finally, there are a few miscellaneous tidbits. Of all the glomerulopathies, the only treatment you need to be familiar with is the use of glucocorticoids in minimal change. It is reasonable for them to give you a kid with nephrotic syndrome and ask the best management. Answer, steroids. By the way, you might be asked about treatment in a kid with post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. The answer in that scenario is supportive treatment and observation. Steroids don't help. Whereas the patient with minimal change will have none of the following, the patient with focal segmental and membranous may be reported with hypertension, hematuria, and or elevation of the creatinine. If they give you a patient with renal insufficiency, you'll be able to recognize either focal segmental or membranous nephropathy by the heavy proteinuria. And finally, recall that membranous is a disease of insidious onset and may be diagnosed in the right clinical setting with a detection of circulating antiphospholipase antibodies. And that will do it for part two of this series on the glomerulopathies. The material covered in this presentation should get you through 99% of the nephrotic questions on test day. If you have any questions or concern about any of this material, please email me at 12 days. Thank you.